Hello everyone. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to talk about some of my comparison with, of Go with Node.js and a little bit about myself. My name is Soros. So my main <coughs> experience in programming is JavaScript and I've used it for like over the past three years. And so I started with uh, Node.js. I program it on the server side. So my focus is mostly on the server side programming and I don't use much of the client side JavaScript. And instead I use mostly Node. And recently, um, if, you, if, you know, if you follow the JavaScript world, there's the IOJS. And, and also I'm the organizer, one of the organizers for JS, Singapore JS Meetup. <coughs> So for JavaScript, I have three years of experience, and I also create my own framework, so which is called Quiver.js. So, um, in in uh, in, uh, in in simple way to say that is that Quiver is a just a next generation web framework I call it, and it's written in this next version of JavaScript, ES six, and inside there I actually use some new programming uh, techniques to combine functional programming and object-oriented programming together and make them work together. So, um, so my point is that uh, I, I follow through different programming paradigms and, and try to make you the best use of all, uh, all of them instead of using like comparing one against each other. And as for Go, I only use it for two months for now. Only beginning of this year, I started using it. And when I started working on Nitrous IO. So at my company, we use Go mostly exclusively on the server backend. So that's how I got my experience. But of course, uh, my programming experience is more than that. So. Before I started using <coughs> JavaScript, I've also used other languages. Among them include C and C++. And I wrote, also wrote a Unicode library, uh, Unicode string library for Boost last time, although it didn't really get accepted. And, and so yeah, I, other than dynamic languages, I also have fairly fair amount of experience in static type languages. And, and of course, um, over the past 12 years, which is when I started programming, I also touched on many other languages like uh, Python, Ruby, and also I actually love uh, types like Haskell. I learned a lot of type concepts in Haskell and then apply them in JavaScript. So all these are just to give you some background about uh, my programming experience so that you know uh, what to expect. And I love I care about the design of programming languages. So when I compare, I try to com compare it objectively instead of telling you stories about how Go is so awesome or how Node is so terrible, something like that. Yeah. So uh, today I'll talk about mostly some of my own opinionated uh, comparison and also some of the good part and bad part and what I think should be the best practices in Go based on my experience in other languages. So it might not necessarily be really the best practice. <coughs> and yeah, since I since I know since I only know Go for really use Go for such a short time, there are many things that I may have get wrong about Go. So do feel free to tell me wrong because I'm also here to learn by sharing my experience and and I hope hope to learn more if you <coughs> can correct me. <coughs> so yeah, this is my first exp exp impression of when I use Go, which is that I thought Go is really like, from a programming language standpoint, Go is quite a weird language. Like, oops. like many people, they, they compare Go with some other languages and say like, Go is great because it's um, static type languages. But I think, 
the thing, the, the, the features that makes Go pop really powerful is actually its dynamic type components. So I feel that Go is really like, um, its powerful part is the dynamic type, type language with some static type compilable printing things like structs and ints that allows Go to be compiled, which also, which is also one of the strengths. So it's like a compiled language with some of the advantage of the dynamic type language. So, um, yeah, so the first part for Go, I think is good, is that uh, it, used, it has this uh, basic building block, which is <coughs> the struct. So um, for those of you who know C, the struct in Go is actually pretty much the same as the C struct. So you are just defining some fields and there's no, as you know, there's no object-oriented programming in Go, so you don't need to worry about all this inheritance and stuff. All you have to do is just define some structs. So I think that's the thing that Go gets it right and that makes it simple. <coughs> but looking further into it, I think the bad part of Go, one of the bad part, is on this initializing structs. So after you're defining that I have an object that has certain characteristic, like for example here, we define like some character in online game, whatever, you, you create a game and you want to define some character. Right. So, so here we we just define the characters by initializing the character struct and just defining all the fields <coughs> on it. So this looks this looks straightforward, but the thing is, anyone can initialize this struct. So it's like anyone can create a character in any way they they, they like, and there's no constraint on that. And then Go also have this uh, weird concept. Uh, I mean weird syntax for pointers, so they, they have this uh, pointer concept which is good. But to initialize it, you have to put like an ampersand in front of it. So, so it, in the end, you get this kind of weird syntax like equals n character and then, and then your initialization parameters. What do you mean by uh, anyone can initialize a structure? So which means like you want to create a, like from over here you want to create a character. So you can just, uh, you can just use this syntax, the end character, and then your fields. So you can just fill it, which I will explain next. So which, which means like, when you define, which means you can create the object with any value you like. So for example here, we create another character, right? But we have some missing fields. We only define like the HP and the level. But some other fields like the name and MP is missing. But Go will ha just happily uh, allow this to happen, like there's no checking or anything, and it will just fill, it, fill in your missing fields with some default value, like from both zero or empty string or now. So every, all the fields in Go is optional. And, and so, so, which means that when people create a project <coughs> based on your strong definition, they can initialize it improperly and then you have some um, missing few definitions. So which got me thinking, like, Go does all the static type checking for you, like, or you, people say that, oh, using Go, I don't need to check, I, I don't need to worry about whether I, I put a wrong type to it. But then you have to, but then, uh, strictly speaking, you really have to check every fields, like from over here in struct, you have to check that your fields are initialized properly and Otherwise, you would have like null pointer exceptions. So I think the root of this problem is actually that um, Go they use structs for two kinds of purposes. Like um, the first kind is what I, I would call a record, which is uh, for example uh, an example is shown here. So I will define record as something like. Um, some data store, so it's like a collection of data that's used uh, that's for used to present information. And the other type of struct usage is for state management, which means like you 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 use it to initialize some internal objects that have some internal state that keep changing over time, 
that will affect that will affect the behavior of the program. So these two things they are actually quite different <coughs> use cases, but they are all being uh, defined as a struct. So for me, I I'll say that uh, I would recommend that to try to distinguish between these two kinds of use case, use case and and um, apply different ways of uh, managing them. So like for example, if you if you have plain structs, like for example, you have a person record. So they might have some many fields like they have name, they have address, many things. But um, some of them they can be optional. So and it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't keep changing and and yeah so on. So you use plain structs as records and don't use it. Uh, don't apply methods to it because because uh, because when you when you define methods to a struct. You're basically intending it to be upgradable mm -hmm. to an interface, mm -hmm. some interface that fulfills the <coughs> method. And then, and then when when people when when people call it, they they expect they expect some uh, encapsulation in it that uh, would that expect some consistent internal state that fill inside the struct. So that's my opinion. And then I also recommend that instead of um, using the ampersand and then your struct and your field definition, <coughs> I recommend like other languages that use a constructor function to create <coughs> your structs. Because inside your constructor function, you can you can have uh, you can have different ways to validate it to make sure that uh, all the fields are present. For example, and also like when modify the fields, you either you either use functions or methods manipulate the structs instead of like modifying the field directly so that you can do some constraint checking. So of course uh, ideally like if you if you have an object if, if you have an object with some internal state um, you you want to expose it as an interface that has uh, some attributes uh, methods and attributes and then um, keep the internal state private to yourself. So for example here we keep the character <coughs> struct private and expose it as a character interface which has some uh, which has only getter functions. So you, for example you can only set the HP but not you can only get the read the HP but not set it directly so that so that you can for example have act methods like you want to attack an enemy and then, and then so you can have some internal state like calculate like from if the HP is how much or armor, all the special abilities. So, so all this yeah, encapsulate it and prevent others from modifying the, it directly. So I think like, um, of course that's the ideal world, but it, it can get pretty verbose like when you have getters, setters, and then, and then your your program would end up look pretty much similar to Java, which is actually bad, <laughs> because we, we don't want to go write Go code like Java code. So it's too bad that I feel I feel that it's pretty too bad that Go don't Go interface they don't have this uh, uh convenient getter interface uh, getter methods or setter methods that uh simplifies the syntax of uh, um defining these accessor methods. So for example here you can't define like in an interface, a character with interface as something with a get name method so like a read only name and HP and then use it use it simply as sort the character dot name instead of character dot get name open bracket close bracket. So yeah. So there was a uh, some of my opinions on and then next is that uh, what I like about Go is this uh, interface upgrade so for for more advanced users you might have seen this kind of pattern like you have a function that accepts an interface and then you check whether it fulfills another interface specification and if so you can upgrade cast that uh, interface cast that object into another interface 
and do optimized special operation on it. So I think that's, a, that's actually a very nice part of the mm. dynamic type programming in Go. <coughs> so you can um, cast and change the type uh, at runtime. So it's like, uh, on the other hand, even though we can, uh, even though we can upgrade the interface of our project, let's say I feel that it's, there's still certain things that is restricted in Go. For example, even though we can upgrade an interface, we can't, we can't really like create an upgraded interface which all with that retain all its original attribute. So like for example here, we have a character and we want to give it superpower, right? So you create a new interface that wraps around that. So your, your character becomes like a, a character that's upgradable with to a super power character. But then let's say your let's say your uh, let's say your character implements some other interface like for example, a villain interface. Then it becomes that even though you can drop it to become upgraded to a super power, but but then you lose the ability to upgrade to other kinds of interface, which, which I think is a kind of a restriction for it. Like it would be great if, if Go allow this kind of even more powerful uh, ways of using interface. So actually, uh, all the things I described just now can also be done in JavaScript. So. So like the interface upgrading is actually a technique that exists in JavaScript which is called uh, prototype inheritance. And for interface upgrading in JavaScript, it's actually, uh, it's, you can actually do it uh, without any overhead because JavaScript is type, type, typing. So, so when you pass in, you get an object, you can just say that, hey, if this object happened to have this attribute, this, if it is, uh, it is upgradable to this other type of object. And then JavaScript also have this uh, getter and setter. And in, in the new version of JavaScript, there's also this symbol fields that, uh, that makes it much more simple to define methods without name clashing. So you can define like for a very ge general name, like a tag, and don't need to worry about uh, it clashing with some other interface met, uh, definitions, for example. So you might, uh, so after hearing all this, like maybe, maybe you don't care, or maybe, maybe you do. But I think that uh, if you think that the Go interface upgrade <coughs> feature is cool, then you should, you should definitely look more into uh, um, taking advantage of this kind of power. So uh, my some some of my so just to quickly go through some of my other comparison of Go with Node. So one thing I really like about Go is that it allows functional programming in a static type language. So you so so here uh, on the top is a Go program that creates a closure that uh, counts just keep counting up counter and below that is a JavaScript counterpart. So you can see that uh, the both of them, of them they are actually pretty similar. So you can actually create this kind of a close, what, what is called a closure function very easily. And functional, functional programming is actually something that's not exploited, um, not, not used very commonly in Go, but it's a very, very powerful programming technique and I really think that Go programmers should take more advantage on it, especially since it gives uh, so, so good support on it. It's a typo. Oh, is it? <laughs> Which one? Culture plus plus. Oh, <laughs> yeah, okay. Thanks for finding out. Yeah, <coughs> then comparing the other thing is error handling. So, so Go actually have uh, also have the, the same uh, error hand, explicit error handling mechanism as no. As you can see here, like the left side is go. So every time you do an operation, it will return a result, but also an error value. So you need to check whether the error value is, is um, now or not. And 
and a lot of people actually don't like about this but in my opinion I think that's a good, good thing because it forces you to think about error states and force you to really consider how this error state flows and how you can you should manage about it. But but the thing I don't like about the error handling in Go is really like the verbose like handling handling errors in Go you require three lines of code. It requires that if error and then not equals to now, then you consider like return error. So I really want it I really want it to have like instead you can have a one liner like if error return error instead of spending three lines because that really takes up a, a lot of code space and your your code is filled out with all the error handling code is, is instead of the proper proper your your actual program logic. You have to handle that. Yeah you have to handle it. Yeah I just want it to be shorter so that you can see more of your code instead of like having one Third of your program as error handling code. Just so static typing error is a pointer. So yeah, yeah. Error. Yeah, of course I can understand. Of course I, I can understand the rationale, but yeah. If you say that you actually don't really have big error, you just pass it If you actually have a big error with an additional <coughs> line, yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, so uh, moving next is that uh, the HTTP handler interface. So, so if you compare the signature of Go with the signature in JavaScript, both of them they actually have very similar signature. And I'm not really sure whether they copy from one another. But I, I, I do know that uh, Node, they have this uh, HTTP handler signature quite a long time ago. But uh, of course, uh, this uh, this is actually a good thing because uh, this uh, this HTTP handler signature is uh, they have a pretty good middleware architecture, which you can use both in Go and Node. And I think this is is in general this is better than than using like all the your MVC frameworks in other languages mm -hmm. like uh, Rails. So so that's why that's that's one of the reason why so many people like about Go. So then uh, another thing that I want to complain is the package naming. So, so uh, if you see here, I, I feel that I, I don't really get like why, why, why is Go using the so, so, so similar package naming convention as Node. On one hand, Node, they have this uh, package naming convention that uh, your package name dot your method because uh, it was a hack around the lack of a module system in JavaScript, but but for Go seriously, like they could have have other notation instead of a dot for calling a function inside inside a, a package. Because in this case, uh, when you when you call like for a user, you, the user package like user not user like it can it can means it can means an object. But also means a package. Then the code look, become very confusing because both the user uh, method call and uh, your package call they have the same notation even though they have completely different meaning. And the other problem is that you have a lot of name clashes. So like from where you have a package name user and you want to define a variable name user, then then your package name will clash and then you 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 will get all sorts of random errors. Hmm? I say name the package something like application. Yeah, that yeah. So that's why. So my work, my recommended work around is actually putting some post fix on it, like from calling your package something lib. So because because uh, of course you can give a completely different name, but uh, in most of the cases you really uh, they really share like the same uh, like you the. Like the firmware, you have a user package, right? We call it user is the <coughs> most straightforward way of naming that package. So, so you don't really want to like think of think too much about of a different name. I would say. 
And also for all the planes like error handling and the package names. Um, the next version of JavaScript, they actually uh, already share, uh, solve these planes that exist in Go, both Go and Node. So for example, in ES6, uh, they have this concept called promises, which, uh, which abstract around uh, the error handling and into the, what's called promise rejection. And then with uh, the ES6 module, you don't even need to, you don't even need to uh, put the name of the package when you want to use a method inside, because you import it beforehand, so you can call whatever method inside your package directly without prefixing your package name. So uh, if you ask me like whether you should go, use Go or JavaScript, my opinion is that uh, currently the current the current version of JavaScript and also current version of Node.js uh, is is certainly uh, that is is not uh, they are they are yeah it's not they are it's not as good as what Go currently provide. So Go Go actually fix have much less uh, pains that than using like JavaScript in ES5 and Node. But, with my, but also, I feel that for the next version of JavaScript, they give JavaScript more, so much more power that it can, it can potentially uh, allow your program to become so much simpler and also so much easier to use. So it's, def it's, it's definitely some, something to check it out. But of course, now, right now, um, ES6 is still under development, and Go is stable and major. So that's another thing to consider. So which means that if you, if, you're pro, if you have a project you want to do it now, I will still recommend you to use Go. And also Go, it has a, the HDB libraries in Go. They are at least as, as good as the HDB framework in Node Express, if not better. And of course, for Go, as a compiled static type language, we have the same set of uh, advantages and disadvantages as a compiled language. So that's all I have to say today. And I would like to end, end my talk with uh, this quote that I think of. So actually, I think that Go and JavaScript, they share much more similarities than the thought. Like as you can see from some of my code examples before, like they, they actually have similar programming paradigms, similar uh, similar concepts. And as for JavaScript, a lot of people came from JavaScript to Go and find it pleasant. It's really because um, the static some of the, this static type nature of Go it enforced them to use to write their program in proper types. On the other hand, in JavaScript, uh, there's a lot of abuse on using the dynamic type system in JavaScript. People write all sorts of crazy programs, JavaScript functions that do all, uh, a lot of crazy things depending on what value of the object they pass in. But I think if the JavaScript programmers, they can like follow the same constraint provided in Go and write properly typed programs in JavaScript, even though you don't have type, even though JavaScript is dynamic type, but if you write properly type pro program in JavaScript, then, then your JavaScript program will be much better and much like, more like Go. And as for Go, Go programmers, I feel that if you can take advantage on some of the dynamic type concepts in JavaScript, <coughs> which you can use by using the interface, then your code it so can also be much more powerful and much, uh, much more modular and get the power, get to write um, something uh, more powerful. So yeah, that's all for me and thanks. In terms of use cases, you mean like, uh, yeah, it depends on what kind of programs you want to develop. Um, for now, I think, for most of the, if you want to write simple programs, 
you can you can pretty much write it in either languages, any language you like. Either language you like. Does that make sense? Surely the rule is if you do it in the browser based and it needs to be JavaScript and you do it. I mean, that's for front end of course. If yeah, it's yeah. server based, it's gotta be going. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, so that's, so that's why I, what I'm comparing is on the server side, like yeah. if you want to build a PHP server. So yeah. You wouldn't it's, do that. You wouldn't want to I, do that in JavaScript. Yeah. I think the, the use case for each is quite different. Like, uh -huh. So like in case of Go that like I said, JavaScript doesn't have true concurrency, which mm -hmm. is something that Go has. And you use it. I think it's very good or like low level stuff, like mm -hmm. maybe a database uh in Go is good. That's right. Right. But uh, if you go high level, like try to write web application to Go, you're calling that's right. That's generally my opinion. Also, like I, I think uh, dynamic type languages are more suitable for uh, very big applications with uh, constantly changing requirements. On the other hand, uh, static type language they are better when you know all the requirements beforehand. But of course, there's uh, another topic to go into details. <laughs> yeah. It is it, it is debatable. Like I said, like uh, um, in dynamic type language, a lot the problem of dynamic type language is actually a lot of people they abuse the dynamic language features that are uh, write and write poorly type programming. And my opinion is that people should write well type programs in dynamic type languages, even though there's no enforcement. Yeah. Um, on that topic, um, in what sense do you think? Yeah. So uh, I didn't really go into details on. I I didn't really search through like what what uh, HDB libraries are there available in Go. But what I see is that all the basic uh, basic HDB like features that you want, you can already find it in Go. Yeah, in in one of the libraries. Well. Yeah. So. So I think in terms of ecosystem, uh, if you if you if you want like basic functionalities, both of them already have it, and and the reason Go can be uh, better in, than Node is mainly because like you have like the callback help flow in Node, mm -hmm. and and also I can understand that a lot of people they prefer programming in type, and if so, then Go is definitely. Uh, more pleasant for them, even though both of them they use the same architecture. Yeah. Um, by the way, point out that uh, the enter center method things, right? Yeah. Uh, by convention, there should not be a get something. Yeah. Uh, like for the one HP and whatever, right? It should oh. just be HP and P. And if you want to set something, then you do a set. Okay. HP. Yeah, that's good. So that's, that's the convention. Uh, and for this kind of uh, interface or, or let's say a struct, right? I wouldn't put those things there. I would only put them in the stats package. Yeah. Or the stats struct. So, but if you, if you tend to put too much inside an interface, right? It becomes, it becomes like becomes class. <laughs> yeah, the, that's, I think I missed one slide that I wanted to see. Probably I accidentally deleted it. <laughs> yeah. So my other complaint is that uh, you, you can't like go, you can define methods for structs, <coughs> but you can't define methods for interfaces, uh, which is one of the restrictions. You're supposed to declare that later. When you yeah. find a pattern of usage, then you think, hey, this can be an interface, then you define interface. Yeah. It's not like Java where you have implement, 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 implement. That's right, that's right. So I, I prefer this way better than uh, you try to put everything first as an interface, then you find your stuff. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, this, this, this example is probably not very good. If you could have used it the right way, or revise, update the slides, and do <laughs> my like actually my the, the way that I hope is that you can define methods on interfaces. 
so which means that like uh, so that you can define like a minimal set of interface like for example you can say like a character interface is something with a getter getter for HP, MP and level and then you can define like from both an attackable character like a character that can attack as another interface that can act based on uh, and, and so you can so you can for example put an attack in another interface called like attackable oh, character. Right to use a different language to in your yeah, yeah. Inheritance. Yeah, so so um I can understand I I can understand uh I can understand what you mean. Uh so so I also agree that like what's the example here is not a very good example. Like. But my point my point really is it's not really about how you design interface, but really how you should encapsulate your data behind the interfaces. Yeah, I feel that now there's no encapsulation on the structs. And if you, for example, here your character, right? If you define it as a struct, and you just pass it around as a struct, people can modify your internal state anyhow they like. Yeah, and so well, there's... Really, what, if you have, let's say, this HP and you get HP as a vector, right? Yeah. Then your properties are all private. Yeah. Yeah. Just don't that's how then you can't use anything or you can't how say instantiate the struct with uh values you don't want. That's unless you keep your struct private. What I see is that there are a lot of programs they actually they just pass the struct around. Um just well, it depends on the contract. Well, yeah, for, like for I think side, I will have to yeah. One, yeah. One, actually, one very good example is the HTTP request struct, right? You, you know? Yeah, I feel that it really should, shouldn't be a struct because like, it's, it's, it's representing something as stretch and it's representing it as a struct, like a HTTP request and response object. Which means technically anyone can mess with whatever field inside. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you, 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 you try to, there, there are certain things you might want that, like, Adding additional headers that are not given by the yeah. uh, usual uh, methods. So you want to do an upload, you have multi-content, mm -hmm. you know, multi-content, multi which you have yeah. 10 files in one. Uh, the standard library, uh, the standard HTTP, not, I wouldn't say it won't allow you to do that, but it allows you to get, you know, this uh, so-called more stuff to it than you throw it inside the actual request body. And then you compose your HTTP get. Yeah. Or post or whatever. So that it does give you a lot of flexibility and then you can actually put in you know the client TLS stuff. Yeah. And you still follow the same thing behind the scenes with your HTTP stuff. Yeah. So uh, it's actually quite powerful. You don't have to have another object that is actually an inheritance of the HTTP of yeah, the yeah. Right? So it's actually quite flexible if you know how to use it, right? Doesn't mean that it has like 20 keywords is easy to learn, right? Yeah, there that's are right. There are certain things in the whole thing which are... But I, it's easy to get started. It's just you need a lot more time to master. Yeah. Let's pinch it out. Yeah. I have a question. Um, so, actually, since I'm comparing You mean like goals? Yeah, and like how different like the same production. So uh, can somebody actually correct me if I oh if if I understand correctly, Go even though it's concurrent, is currently only running on single thread, right? Single by uh, default. Yeah. No, no JavaScript is strictly single thread. Yeah. The same with Go. Yeah. Oh, it's what's Go is go 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 yeah. So basically there's two of the uh, yeah, so, and then you can remove that. Yeah. So, say, um, yeah. and then you can yeah. have yeah. 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 so, yeah. yeah. so, yeah. so, yeah. so, everything. So, that's why it has code routines. Yeah. So, that's why it's key. Yeah. So, yeah, so in Go, there's this concept called Go routines. So, Go routines is actually uh, a very flexible way for you to uh, write concurrent programs. 
so you your concept is basically that your goal programs can have many many process like these goal routines they run concurrently so uh, but what I know is that I think Go is by default Go runs on single threaded and as I see the way the current Go programs are running I my feeling is that if you enable Go on running on multiple processor which means like if you actually run Go as parallel there will be a lot of uh, actually there will be a lot of race conditions happening. Go routine um, encourages you to pass data around, yeah. and data is actually immutable. So race condition will not happen because data is immutable. You pass a struct to a channel buffer, that struct is cloned. So you have your goal, your master goal routine with one struct and the child goal routine with another struct, which is two different structs. So you don't have race condition. But if you, if you pass in pointers, then you will be... Passing pointers is just as your fault? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so it depends on how you use the, the thing up. and so also one thing I do run multi thread The first time I did that, of course, race here, race there. Yeah, yeah. But you have to you know have to take which care type of it, is right? unsafe for certain things. So like if you have uh, slices, maps, those kind of things, you when you plan to run against multiple thread, make sure you have lock unlocks. Yeah. Then uh, yeah, certain things like weights or whatever, those, those things will really help you. You at least don't have to free up RAM or free up memory for those kind of things. But yeah, the lock unlock is actually quite fast unless you you put the lock at the wrong place where it's a for loop that will take forever yeah. and then other routines cannot access the variables and that kind of I thing. think it's not the performance of the lock and the lock that's the problem. No, it's no. the, it's no, the no, synchronization. No. Synchronization. Yeah. Lock and then run something long and then after that unlock because uh, the Go uh, routine will not have a free time to do other routines you might have to put like some milli slips there so that you can jump to another routine so those kind of things are right, uh, in case but yeah, right. yeah it's like a lot of common cases uh, my, my opinion is that I still think that uh, running single thread single thread concurrency is the right way to go well, it, it depends on what type of program. Yeah, yeah of course, right. that's debatable. But that's my personal opinion. Yeah, I think I like if you, if you, yeah, there's, there's a lot, there's a, a lot of uh, messy corner cases that come out once you run things in parallel, which is something that you have to take care of in Go. Then you can do things like 15k per second replies for you know replies those kind of things. That's right. Only you can do that with. Uh, yeah, agreeable. There's uh, some very specific use case. So like one, one thing I would recommend using Go is like if you have some very very process intensive algorithms that can be parallelized, then definitely you can use it for Go. Hey, uh, Node.js also has properties now. Hmm? No, Node.js no is like a single threaded micro task. So you have everything in callback, so you can also it's you, you don't, Yeah, that's what, yeah. that's what I'm saying. It, it, you don't have to use callbacks. Like say, for example, if you use POA, uh, PO. That's you generators. Can, yeah, it's a core routine. It's a core routine. Yeah. It's not really it's core system. routine. It's just something that's run concurrently. Uh, so yeah, Java three. Okay. Yeah. So 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 like if you if you if you if you read if you watch some of the slides, some of the Go talks, one of the very good talks I think is by Rob Pike is that concurrency is not parallelism. Yeah, I'm not talking about parallelism. Yeah. So the what I'm is concurrent, is but it's not parallel. What I'm saying is that uh, Go routines which uses fibers yeah. can be done uh, with Node.js as well. But yes, say for example, that's not standard want, extension. Yeah. Uh, you guys are uh, running a short time. I think there are many questions you can ask. <laughs> 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 on the list, so it was an interesting discussion. Um, okay, thanks. Thank you, Soros. Yeah, yeah. Very interesting. Facebook group is always open for